Okay, we're recording. I know to my viewers, there's always a little lag time. You're watching me just stare at my screen for five seconds, and that's because my computer doesn't prompt me properly. So there, that's my defense on that. Hey, thanks again, everybody, for joining another one of my uh, webinar interviews. This is probably interview number 15 or 20 at this point. I, I've lost track. But once again, I've managed, <laughs> despite myself, to line up some more great guests. And I don't know why they keep agreeing to you know talk to me. Uh, because I'm a complete idiot and a bit of an annoying jerk. But here I am <laughs> once again with a great guest. Um, first off, I am joined once again by my uh, partner in crime, my former colleague, my best friend from DeSales University, Dr. Rodney Hauser. And uh, he's professor of theology at DeSales University. Has been now for, what, 22 years, Rodney? Yeah, it's my 23rd, I think. Ugh. And you're also the, the publisher you know, I've never bothered to say online here, what are your books? Tell the whole crowd here what your books are, because maybe they'll sell three more copies. <laughs> well, um, you know, I have the uh, the first book I wrote on Balthazar uh, is his relationship with Protestantism, uh, the ecumenical implications of his theological style, I think is the subtitle. Yeah. Uh, and then there's the little more uh, generalist sort of uh, guide for the perplexed. Uh, there's the book you and I did together on how Balthazar changed my mind. Uh, yeah. And then, you know, I'm, I'm, in, I have two things in the works right now, but it'll probably be a while before either of them, uh, see the light of day. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of like me right now. That's like, okay. So we're now, now uh, cause I, I want to say something about our, our other guests, our main guest, the guest of honor. And once again, though, Rodney, we're talking really here about politics and religion and church. So this is more on your wheelhouse than mine. So feel free to chime in at any time. That's why I bring you on here to bail me out when I don't, know what to say anymore uh so uh our, our our main guest is dr andrew willard jones uh dr jones uh is the director of the catholic studies program at franciscan university of steubenville is that correct dr jones that is correct you nailed it and you are also one of the uh co-originators i believe of the website new polity which mm -hmm. is fantastic i mean i can't i i book market i go to it all the time you and mark barnes have just knocked it out of the park with that website it makes my blog site look like amateur hour but we want to talk today you've got a couple of books out but the, the one uh, that really caught my eye actually the only one of your books i've read other than your nine million page communio article that we were talking about <laughs> uh, i've just inflated it from what i said before 900 to 9 million uh, before, yeah. I don't know if this, the, the wording might be inverted on the screen, but before church and state, a study of social order in the sacramental kingdom of St. Louis, the 19th, uh, the ninth, I should say, not 19th. And uh, it's, it's just a marvelous, marvelous book. I, I just devoured it when I, when I first got it. Um, I, I think it's a tour de force. I just think it's, it's just magnificent. And so we're going to tear into it today. But you also have a new book out that I haven't gotten. And I was doing sort of research on your bio for the interview that I saw. He's got a new book out that I simply must get. It's called The Two Cities, A History of Christian Politics, uh, which, according to what I read, was a more popular, you know, yeah, a less, not necessarily a hard hitting scholarly thing like the other book is. Um, and I, uh, the second I, book I was really thinking of with my my students in mind, you know, my like my undergrad students. So it's, well, it, that's it was why. <laughs> that's why i'm interested in reading it because as i age my brain is atrophied to that of a 21 year old <laughs> Intelle intellectually speaking intellectually speaking so I, I you know i just speak in grunts now because it's just it's got, so <laughs> it, 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 Anything that's simple is is right up my geriatric alley. So anyway, uh, you're, you're, we're going to talk about essentially issues of church, state. But I want to start with a very simple question. Why is actually that phraseology, church and state, why is that misleading? Oh, wow. That is that is the question, isn't it? Yeah, okay. Uh, let's go for it. So it assumes right from the very beginning when we say church and state that our world, our social world is divided into two realms, right? One that is religious and one that's not. So when we say church, we mean in the modern world, we, we tend to mean the, the, the place where there's religious stuff, right? And then when we have, and what do we mean by religious stuff? Well, then we just keep going, building these definitions. But, but what, what we're ultimately saying is that there's an area of our life, some area of our life, a, a very large swath of our life that we call politics or economics or whatever, 
in which God just really isn't relevant. So like religion just isn't really a part of that realm. And that's the realm of the state. And then you have this other realm, which is where God is relevant, which is the realm of the church. So dividing it into church and state is always also a dividing into the secular and the religious, right? Um, so and a way we can maybe see this was, is that you can say states, we have no problem with the idea of a religious state, for example, but we think of, so like a theocracy, but we think of religion as then being uh, like a, a, a modifier for state, which is this fundamental thing, which could be a communist state. It could be a liberal state. It could be a, any number of different kinds of states. And one of the states it could be is a Christian state or an Islamic state or something, right? But the point would be right. that the state itself is, 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 has some essential characteristics that are other than an orientation towards the divine, right? That there's somehow, yeah. it's, um, that's an inessential aspect of what it may or may not be. Uh, so what it's thinking, what we are doing there, of course, is dividing up human beings into, you know, these, this division, uh, often it's sort of a, it can be a proxy for sort of nature grace divisions, a proxy for natural supernatural, a proxy for public private divisions. There's all different other binaries that, um, that we, we tend to divide our world up into. And sometimes those correlate or line up with church and state divisions, um, but you know, th this is the, the main problem is that human beings are not so divided. We're actually like integral beings, <laughs> right? And so- Oh, so really? Doing... Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I'm pretty much disintegrated most of the time. Uh, and I'm happy to make that sharp distinction between religion and non-religion in my own life. It's quite convenient, actually. <laughs> but yeah, but, I mean, it's, 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 but isn't it's that true? Religion. <laughs> but isn't that the point? Isn't the privatization of religion, if we can call it that, mm -hmm. as a modern creation, I mean, it essentially served political purposes to so domesticate and privatize Christianity in particular. Am I right? Oh, yeah. I mean, the state, the state is, the modern state is invented and promulgated for the purpose of marginalizing the church. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, these aren't like, yeah. this is like, it happened to happen that way. Like, if you go back and read John Locke or something, it's like, no, that's what he's doing. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, yeah. <laughs> oh, no, wait a minute. Wait a minute. John Locke. Come on. America. <laughs> America. John Locke. Don't be, don't be doing that to us now. Uh, but yeah, okay. I mean, uh, I mean, I, I read Mike Hanby's great uh, three piece thing uh, and over a new polity, which was sort of, you know, an, an anti-Lockean sort of analysis. Uh, and so I agree. Rodney, uh, do, do you want to jump in here? Yeah, a comment maybe, and then uh, maybe then a follow-up question. Um, yeah. You know, I think the, the, the brilliance of, of what you all are doing over at New Polity and, and stuff like that is we, we tend to think, I think, of the Enlightenment as having all of these separate projects that have nothing to do with each other. So there's, first of all, the wonky philosophy that you start to get with kind of Descartes and, and uh, you know, rationalism on the one hand and, and then radical empiricism like in Hume on, on the other. Then you have the project of modern science, which is, you know, looking at the universe in a kind of mechanistic way. And then you have the project of modern politics. Um, and it's, it just seems to be just be extremely naive to think that the guys who were creating a new political vision were not influenced by the wonky philosophy on the one hand and the scientism uh, on the other. I mean, it's, 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 I think it's really important that we see that all of these things are a, of a piece and they're all of a piece in their rejection of a particular tradition. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. Alison Del Noche makes the point that uh, modernity simply is the rejection of the Christian Greco-Roman synthesis. It's and already no. already yeah. in Protestantism yeah. you start to get a, an allergy uh, towards that that synthesis. So that's I think that's really helpful to just recognize that you know like Bacon is Hobbes's secretary. We don't we don't right. think right. So we think of Hobbes politics, we think Bacon science, but they're all you know they're kind of all in bed together. And that's what I think Hamby brings out beautifully in that review that that you know you just want to say oh this Lockean just the politics stuff is innocent of any metaphysical, theological sorts of claims, but that just, that just doesn't hold water. And I, uh, no, it's, it's, 
it's just not true. I mean, I just last night, because for my political philosophy class that I'm teaching right now, we're doing, we're starting on the Leviathan. Yeah. And so I'm rereading Hobbes. And, and of course, of course, like the parts that we normally skip to, to his politics, the social contract theory, blah, 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 blah. And it's like, no, no, no. All of that for him is completely integrated into his physics. Yeah. Right. And, and, and then in, also into his metaphysics. And in order to, in order to understand why the politics follows, you have to grant him his 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 metaphysical and, and scientific understanding. Right. Okay. These things are totally connected. Right. Uh, I mean, of course, right. that, that's that's right. Um, and the, you see the same thing with, of course, with someone like John Locke. I mean, it's identical. Yeah. Um, so so I guess what I what I, what I'd say is that the 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 sidelining. The cre so so this is where it's malicious, right? So the creation of the church state division is not um sometimes it's presented often as the sort of uh emergence of the proper ordering. Okay, so that like what, what happens prior to modernity is that this religious thing is somehow dominating over the secular thing, and that's nasty and wrong, and we need to properly order them. Um but the but the truth is it's what what you see in the pre-modern world is not the domination of religion over other things that's not what's what's going on Th those categories themselves don't exist right like what modernity is is the creation of that categorization system like that's not so it's um like the medieval world or the pre-modern world is exactly not a theocracy because those words wouldn't make sense to them <laughs> right <laughs> right those categories that's right are yeah right yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, no. it, it wouldn't make sense to them. And, uh, um, no, oh, I just lost my, uh, so, so I mean, what I was going to say was that if you read, if you read something like, uh, one of the things I, I always have my students read is, is John Locke's, um, letter on letter on toleration. What's the name of it? Something like that. Anyway. Yeah. Um, and, and in there you get, you really are seeing in a very succinct way, a very succinct document, like in one document, really the creation of this category that we think of as the religious, which is identical to the category of the private. And the real upshot of it is that what goes in that category is anything that is, is deemed socially irrelevant or ought to be socially irrelevant. All right. So anything that has, that ought not to be engaged in anything that has social consequences goes in that category. And he puts Christianity entirely in that category, right? So, so it's a, uh, the, the creation of the category of the private is created as the place to stick the church, <laughs> right? So we don't yeah. like, which is also the creation of the church in the modern way that we think of the church. Right? Isn't this in many ways, I mean, it is some ways the product of Christianity's self-immolation in the Reformation and post-Reformation, because, I mean, you talk about the physics and the science. A, a lot of what's driving this is also this notion of truth, which has been attenuated. It's, it's, it's shortened to simply mean that which we can verify through sort of logic and empirical observation. So in a lot of ways, it's, it's more than just the construction of this fiction called religion, which privatizes then supposedly non-public things like religions of revelation. But it also, I mean, the fact value distinction cuts much deeper than that as well. So, and that's one of the reasons why, too, I think you see the marginalization of the humanities in, in the modern day university, because after all, that's that's just a bunch of dead white men's opinions about things, right? Um, none yeah, of it's verifiable. It's none of it has public warrant. So anyway, go ahead. Yeah, it's reduced to like aesthetics. <laughs> It's like art. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty. Yeah. You, you know, it's like poetry or something. Yeah. Which, yeah, which sure is party. Yeah. Rodney? Which is an unjustified denigration of poetry, I think. But it but the idea of just being <laughs> that it's um that that it's like you said, that it lacks it lacks real truth content. You know, at least at least like at yeah. least like biting truth content. It might have it might have some sort of um aesthetic aesthetic truth, but not but not real hard truth. So, right. so, is, so let's get back to something. Is it wrong to call Catholicism a religion? I, yes. <laughs> I mean, okay, but, but, but you, you get into these, you guys like I get, we guys like me always get into this trap because, because I think, yes, I think that is a mistake. I think it would be better if we, if we, 
if we developed a new idiom, a new way of talking, that eventually we would be able to stop doing that <laughs> because I think it's misleading. But when you say things like that, just to normal people, they're shocked and horrified and it's not a smart thing to do. Yeah, exactly. Because, well, yeah. And like, and yeah like because... All of a sudden, administrators at the university are like, he said what? And it's like, no, no, I didn't mean that. Yeah. You know, yes, so uh, you got to be we're... careful. Well, but we're no, going no, to no, abolish no. the... <laughs> we're going to abolish the Department of Religion because there ain't no such thing. And uh, no, yeah, right. you just, oh, great. When you, you get rid of those funny. faculty lines. Hey, so Hauser, <laughs> chime in here. No, you look, you look. It, really, it really is. Um, I'm sorry. It really is a mistake because religion as a and there's guys who've done some work on this recently. That's very, very enlightening that religion as a as a sociological category mm -hmm. is tied to the idea of there being multiple religions. Yeah. Right. So there's Islam and there's buddhism there's hinduism there's judaism there's christianity mm -hmm. there's multiple religions that satisfy the category of religion and th and so as a sociological concept it has baked into it already the modern religious yes. relativism the the secular is the the, the private, yeah. private yeah. public distinction the reality of the secular and and that is a mistake when when we're talking about what catholicism believes itself to be so even if even if you thought catholicism was not true you would at least acknowledge that catholicism does not believe itself to be a religion among other religions <laughs> yeah, you, know, <laughs> you know it's interesting one of the things that's interesting i've been reading a lot of bill cavanaugh lately william cavanaugh yeah. whose stuff i like and uh, he was talking about augustine's city of god and his um, i'm going to be actually interviewing him on friday his new book field hospital but he was talking about City of God in that book, and it's very interesting. He goes, you know, if you, when you read the City of God, what's really kind of fascinating is that Augustine, even though he's, he's you know, he's living long after Constantine uh, and then during the sort of period of the demise of the Roman Empire, he gives us no theory of the state and he gives us no real theory of religion and isn't really giving us any theory about the apparatus of how those two things. What he gives us is, in a sense, a performative analysis of history, a performative analysis of what re what we might call religion and what we might call the state. And it's right. a very sophisticated performative analysis because he sees he sees the intertwining of, of tenant, you know, the libido dominandi versus the love of God cuts through the entirety of society in so many different ways. And so Kavanaugh seems to favor a, a very functionalist, a more functionalist understanding or definition of religion, uh, perfor a performative definition of religion rather than this reified, substantive, essentialized thing. Hey, but Hauser, you, you, I, you look like you want to add something here. Well, no, this is a really interesting uh, trajectory to kind of go down. Um, and then I, I do want to have a I have a question about Augustine later, but um so it seems to me that in 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 Thomas and in Augustine, there's a there's first, there's a kind of presupposition of of a natural religiosity in human beings, which I think they would see as a, a kind of an implicit desire for God or something like that. So right, so religio right. would be this kind of de desire for God that Aquinas says almost everybody has, right? A kind of vague, and he's actually a little bit easier. Like he has that objection to the John the Democene in one of his where he's talking about whether we need what what is it uh do we need proof for the existence of God or is God's existence self-evident right and one of the objections is that it's that we have because we're in the image of God we all know that there's a God so we don't need any proof or whatever and you expect if you read Aquinas in a certain way for him to just summarily dismiss John the Democene for being too immanentist or, or something or whatever but he doesn't he actually says well there that there is truth in this because everybody does basically have some vague sense of what God is. However, sort of like notions of the soul, these things can get really, you know, not so kosher. You know, you think that the soul is material or it's just a part of the body or, or, or whatever. Therefore, you can come up with an idea of God that is also really insufficient. But what it enables him to do when he says that kind of human beings have this natural religiosity, this natural inclination towards God, a, a capax dei, you know, a capacity for God, is he's able to see the Catholic faith as, as being uh, something like act to potency, right? So that, so that religions, therefore, aren't kind of outside of the Catholic faith. They're, they're all 
gropings towards something which we were lucky enough to be gifted like god was gracious enough to say hey i'm going to help you guys out and you're groping a little bit i'm going to reveal this thing to you you know and then of course the virtue of faith is our participation in god's insider knowledge of of god right so it's a so there's a, i think of thinking of religions in terms of a relationship of various potencies getting closer to act and, and of course, that means that even the Roman Catholic Church, even though the true religion subsists in the Roman Catholic Church, it's not yet, we're not yet the glorified church, you know, we're not yet in heaven seeing right, God right, in right. face. So even there, there's room for, for growth and progress. So we're all kind of, in a sense, in an act of potency towards this true religion, which is in a state of act, right? And it, rather than seeing these parallel, like five different religions or seven different religions or whatever, all hermetically sealed off from each other. Yeah. Oh, you're frozen. Oops. We got. We just had a little uh, hiccup there. Uh -oh. Uh, okay. Everybody okay? I, I can hear everybody. Uh, you know, I, I, you, you didn't freeze for me, just for uh, Andrew. So, Andrew, okay. do you want to respond okay. to that? Yeah, yeah. So, so I think this is very um, insightful, and in and I think that I'll say a couple things on it. One would say it would be that I think that what you just articulated has to be the basis for our understanding of like uh, religious liberty, for example, <laughs> that, that, that the reason why we can talk about such things is, is because we have an, uh, the understanding of religion that you just articulated, that, that to the extent that things that we call religions are movements towards religion proper, we yeah. are movements from that potency to act to that very extent, they have a, a, a right, if we want to use that word, but whatever, they, they, they are justified in their existence, right? Um, because they are they are that proper movement. Now the thing the thing would be would be not my my only hesitation would be to to say that that natural religiosity that we're talking about that natural inclination towards the divine and man is also the basis of our idolatry. So it's also that aspect of us that makes us capable of such monstrous sin, right? <laughs> like because yeah. we make ourselves yeah. God. Out of position yeah. or, or the yeah. creation of our, something we create and we control, we attempt to 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 put in that position. Now, the reason why we're attempting that so is because of what we're talking about. Because we can't just leave that place in our soul empty. And so, what are we going to fill it with? We're going to try to fill it with something we create, we control, we dominate. And so, I think I, th I guess what I'm saying is that if you read something like Augustine, someone like Augustine, you can see that. There, there is such thing as a natural religiosity, but it's very often uh, horribly unnatural, right? Like, like it's very often, it's very often the, that that natural religiosity is the reason why we're capable of condemning the sin so, 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 of, so uh, ardently, right? Like we can see how wrong it is, and so, and so, the, what that means then is that religions, you don't want to become. Like for every for every time we look in other religions and we see movements towards the truth of the true religion, we also have to see in other religions the movements away from it. Yes, and toward um, a, a wickedness. Right. So if you think of, uh, I mean, the pagans are the uh, are the easiest because there's not many of them around, so we can beat on beat up on them <laughs> without offending. Them. But the, <laughs> well, at least that's one of the reasons. And that's who Dustin goes after. Speak right? for but, yourself. I, I have my, like, <laughs> I have a lot of neo pagan, pagan moments. <laughs> they just all around. We seem to not care about offending too much. So, the the uh, the but but the the story that Saint Augustine tells, of course, and and I think the, it's the biblical narrative, is that after yes. the fall, after the fall, we move into the creation of of temple states slave states with god kings i mean culminating in sort of pharaoh in egypt and all of this and that those are also a product of our nature our religious nature right like it's not it's not that our grasping after god is always good <clears throat> i mean it's always good you know but it can be directed e e in an evil way <laughs> right oh, if you, if you understand what I, mean. I mean it's the essence the essence of idolatry i mean I think it's another one of the advantages to Augustine's approach to things is that uh, it, it's not so much the divide isn't so much between religion and secularity, religion and irreligion, as it is between idolatry and true worship uh, of a proper thing, God. Um, so I, I think that's yeah, very no, insightful. 
Go ahead. Yeah, it's, it's really it's it's like the question is in the way Augustine will frame it is is are we are we looking up like, like into the infinite mystery for in search of God or are we or are we looking down you know to what we can build and control to find God right like those are those are the two the two like orientations of the city of man and the city of God um, yeah. both both of which have to do with the divine right and 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 he's just directly says. Of course, that it, not only God, who we think God to be, but we're directly in league with hierarchies of angels. Either way, <laughs> yeah. Right? I mean, so, if you're looking down, I mean, it, even worse. I mean, you, you, could, you could be looking at your gut or your crotch or your veins uh, as well. You know, more more sort of carnal things. I mean, I, I like to mm -hmm. say that in, in the libido dominandi, there are only three gods, Moloch, Mammon, and Dionysius. <laughs> and and, and I, well, you can maybe add Ares, war, but that might be related right. to Moloch. I don't know. <laughs> um, but, well, yeah. So, um, yeah. But anyway, um, I want to, before we get too much further, I mean, the, the, the big part of your book is actually, I mean, you're a historian, and a, and a big part of this book is, an analysis of the sort of the sacramental mediation of reality during the social era of Louis the Ninth. So, before we get out of here, let, let's unpack that. What do you mean by that? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, before we go on, let me just say this too, <laughs> so you can collect your mm -hmm. thoughts a little bit more. Yeah. Um, it's a uh, there's a lot of talk these days about what a post liberal order would look like. And, you know, it's probably going to be something radically different, radically new, something we, we just have to let grow organically. We can't guess at or grasp at. But my thinking is that in, in these areas, there's really, in many ways, nothing new under the sun. And a post-liberal order is probably going to look a lot like a pre-liberal order, only one that has been chastened by the genuine insights of modernity about things like religious liberty and so on. Uh, and, and that's and so I, that's what kind of what I was thinking. When I was reading your book. Um, but anyway, go ahead. No, I, I mean, I, OK, so so what makes it remarkably different and I use the word sacramental and I think it's the right word. OK, but but maybe people yeah. could, could get annoyed by it. But the reason is that there's a there's a dynamism of of fulfillment. So so uh, let me try to explain it. So. So think about like the relationship between law and grace, right? In the in the Catholic tradition, we'll, we'll talk about that there are there are there is a law which is instruction or sort of external articulation of the truth, and then gr grace um, acts on us internally to internalize the law and to become it. Okay, in a sense, right? To become yeah. a sort of living. Yeah. It, similarly, the relationship between sort of externals and internals. So when you think about a sacrament, right, there's the externals, the material things, but they, but what they symbolize, so their law or their, their meaning is also what they affect. Okay, so they actually carry the grace that they symbolize in them. So the relationship between the externals and the internals are bound up together, right? They're not they're not separated. And 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 so if you look at something like when you look at medieval France, 13th century France, which is what I'm looking at, they're understanding then all of society to be sort of to be like this. Okay, so there are there are laws, there's externals, there's buildings, there's all the sort of stuff of our world. But all of that is interpenetrated by grace, by the preaching of the clergy, by the grace that comes through the sacraments that then elevates it beyond itself and perfects it. Okay, so so um, this is a this sounds maybe abstract, but it, but it can be very simple. It's things like, like why is a society of peace possible? Right. So so they presume, for example, that that peace is the is the primordial condition or peace is a sort of uh, the standard, the place where you begin in looking at society. The society is in a condition of peace and then sin tears at it and then you have to deal with that. But the reason why they can they can conceive of that is because in, in Christianity, in the sacramental life, they are capable of of achieving peace. <laughs> okay, so you're capable of a degree of virtue. You're capable of love, um, not per perfect love, which is the reason why you still need the the external apparatuses, the structures, right? You still need those, um, well, you need them for multiple reasons, but one of them is because of sin. 
But those external structures are always aimed at being internalized through Christianity, the living of Christianity, into a society of people. Um, so they have a fulfillment in them. There's a dynamism to them. It, there's, a, there's a movement to it, um, which is very foreign to a modern political mind in which you're, we're looking at some sort of static constitutional regime. Right. So they yeah. they don't they wouldn't think of it that way at all. Instead, it's like a pastoral regime. Right. And it's about the it's ultimately about the efficacy of the sacraments. So how much leniency, how much severity does the law have to have in order to make the reception of the sacraments the most efficacious? This is the type of questions that a so-called political authority would have to be asking and it's what they're mm -hmm. what they are asking. Uh, so so oh, it's all aimed ultimately towards perfection. Right. Towards salvation. I, that that's just um, it, it makes me want to go live there it's like when i read lord of the rings i wanted to move to the shire so now all of a sudden i want to be teleported back to the era of louis the ninth because that just sounds that sounds ideal so it, you know would you agree then i don't know if you you're familiar with him but i mean i'm, I'm assuming you are i mean i've always been uh rather smitten with brad gregory's book the unintended reformation where he makes the claim that essentially all the elements for for a, a a quite beautiful society are already there in, in, in the medieval worldview. Uh, but the church mm -hmm. sort of scuttled the through her lack of charity, essentially. And then her greed, her charity, she's come to sin and things sort of flew apart because of that. So are, would you be saying then that, that in, in some ways the way forward is, is, is not I'm, I'm groping for the right word obviously not a restorationism which is impossible but are you arguing that the way forward then in terms of a post-liberal model would be to retrieve a, let's put let's use that word to retrieve a great deal of what you just said yeah so i think that i think that one of the there's a, there's a going backwards can help us in a number of ways looking backwards one of them is allowing us to break out of the constraints of our current category system okay so to 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 see a different way that yeah. then allows us to think creatively okay so and and that and 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 in doing that also what we're doing is building a in order to understand that other world the medieval world from within Catholicism, so not as a liberal would understand it, but how, how a Catholic would understand it, right? One of the things that that allows us to do imaginatively is sort of turn the tables on modernity and provide an account of modernity that is that comes from the Catholic tradition and the Christian tradition, rather than allowing modernity to give an account of us. Okay, so 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 we, good we can understand it, yeah. modernity better. Yeah, we can understand modernity better than modernity can understand itself is what I'm getting at, because there's a there's a foolishness and a conceit in modernity. And 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 if you go if you go prior to it and then look at its development, then you can get a handle on what's really happening. And and so that um, that I think is extremely valuable uh, and a necessary exercise. Now, what what do we build going forward? Well, you know, reform. Reform is a weird thing in the church historically because reform always has that going back movement, but then it, it always like the look back and then when it comes forward though, what's actually built is different, yeah. right? So, cause, because what's actually built is is a reform of the corrupt society, right? So, so because no society is entirely corrupt, right? Like part of the meaning of corruption, I think, is that there's lingering justice in it. Like it's, it's corrupt because it's not totally depraved. And, and so what, what becomes reformed and redeemed out of it still is recognizable or, or has characteristics of the corrupt society. So if you look at, um, uh, let's take a reform like the, the, the high medieval reform, right? Like that, that, that spills out of Cluny and the monasteries and then reforms the post Carolingian world. So we're talking about, you know, 10th starting 10th century, but really the 11th century into the 12th century. And, and it's a massive reform movement societal wide. I mean, it has massive implications. It's really the, the world I talk about in the book is sort of the culmination of this reform movement. Right. But what comes out of it is not a restoration of the patristic world. Like what comes out of it is a reformed feudal world, right? Like right. it's there you still, go. it's still has a lot of the structures yeah. and recognizable as feudal, but it's reformed and Christian. 
And, and, and so I imagine, I imagine what we'll build out of modernity will, will be similar, right? Like there'll be aspects of it that maybe we might even be surprised what aspects are, are salvaged, right? So <laughs> I don't is, is I'm going to, is my, mo is modernity reformable in the same way that uh, feudalism was? Oh man, it seems like there's a lot, a lot. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I, I, no, I, I, I think it's probably, it's, I think that the illusion, the, the analogy might be more like um, the pre-Christian um, Roman world versus the post-Christian one. <laughs> that might okay. be better analysis. Because yeah. because part yeah. of what part of what happens in modernity, I think, is like you you've said a couple times in the interview already, and I and you're very right, and I think it's very insightful to to acknowledge that that modernity is something that Christendom did to itself, right? Like we weren't invaded, there wasn't like an outsiders that came in, and and lots of times when we tell the story of modernity in places like at Franciscan, we fall prey to this all the time. We, we, we're telling the story of Christianity, and then all of a sudden these like bad guys show up, right? And all of a sudden, like, <laughs> yeah, awesome doing something, and then yeah. this guy's doing something, and then, and it's like, yeah, but, but you know, those, those guys didn't show up from anywhere else, right? Like they, they are, they, they are, that's Christendom, that's, that's the church, um, in a sense, an apostatizing movement within the church. Yeah. And, um, and modernity then, modernity then is that so that is like the outcome of that of that movement from within the church and and i think that because of that maybe there's a more profound rejection of christianity in certain aspects of, of modernity i mean like we've already yeah, that's talked kind about of what i was driving yeah rodney I, I'm, i've been dominating the conversation here hauser i should turn this over <laughs> to you no no this, this is all this is all really really good i mean i think that what we're kind of getting at here is maybe thinking of, of modernity as a Christian heresy, right? I think is, is can be a helpful way of thinking about it. Cause that would be a little bit different there, than the reform of say feudalism or something like that. Um, right. Although there were, there were maybe heretical elements in that or whatever, but um, yeah. So, so when, when you think of a heresy, you recognize it's partial truth. Right. And, and then you make it hold something else together with it. And, and it seems to me that liberalism just is sort of the excising of maybe one half of, of the Chalcedonian thing. It's just, you know, it just it, it, this is where, you know, so so, uh, you know, at my college right now, you know, I'm in kind of a battle with certain people who who want to sort of reduce Catholic identity to, you know, DEI sort of issues. Right. And, and of course, you can't just come out and say that diversity, ex inclusivity and equity are bad things. I mean, you know, so it's not like I'm saying, oh, my gosh, no, I would you, say that. Yeah, yeah, I hate diversity. <laughs> but most would. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I certainly don't want to be inclusive. Get the hell out of my house. Yeah. 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 But you know what I mean? So, so it's, in other words, these are obviously, you know, like obviously, you know, the church wants to welcome as many people who will possibly, you know, can come in and stuff like that. But of course, we we no longer talk about the need to repent, believe and be baptized, you know, so or or we talk about diversity, which is a, a value of sorts, I guess. But you don't talk about the fact that, you know, the church is also really, really concerned with unity. And it just seems like uh one way of, I think, thinking of liberalism is to just think of it as a radically truncated form of Christianity, which needs the other half of Christianity to hold together. Because what's happened, and this is what I think I was going to ask you, Andrew, like, why do you think this post-liberal moment is kind of happening now? And I, I would like to hear your answer to that. But obviously, yeah. one of the things that's happening is we're realizing that liberalism in a really unhealthy way is grasping it to bring back some of those things like uh, orthodoxy speech control, you know, you know, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, it can't really do out without the other half of the truth. So it brings them back in really sort of destructive and, and, and creepy ways. And, and so right, maybe which is, which is sort of ironically the end of liberalism, isn't it? I mean, so, so like the, the yeah. liberalism now, now here's what I'll try to, I'll try to, I'll try to just jump off what you just said. Cause it's very interesting. Okay. So, so, so I think that, um, the way I tend to tell a story and the way I tell the story in the two cities is, is that we start with the French revolution. Cause it's a fun place to start. Um, 
and you, and if you look at like the, the 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 slogan liberty equality fraternity all right that they that they out of the the destruction of the revolution and all the intellectual aspects and the political aspects of the whole scene that's going on it um and then of course what's going on in england is a slightly different thing but whatever okay so we're just talking about the 19th century at this point you get a sort of splintering of of christianity or what's left of christendom i think into the ideologies the modern ideologies and so so like liberalism which i think is is a sort of heir to the liberty side of the revolution it's socialism or the equality side nationalism the fraternity side right and that there's a, there's a once christianity is removed the 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 sort of um fruitful tension that liberty equality and fraternity um whole uh the, the way in which they work together towards the creation of a christian society mm -hmm. those become splintered and turned against each other and so you get a sort of radical ideology of liberty radical ideology of equality a radical ideology of fraternity where those the, each one of those comes to do within the ideology dominate the other two right and and so they become christian heresies in a very profound sense like they have one one aspect of what's true about society of, about history about human beings um and then because they've made that the supreme uh value they are actually at war with the other ones and so yeah. you get the history of the 19th century and obviously the 20th century which is humanity just destroying itself as it tries to to do without christianity but what i think that there was because of that there was there was a sense Christians got sort of duped into thinking that Christianity was compatible with those modern ideologies because the ideologies were still her heresies of Christianity. <laughs> okay, so there was like so there was like a, a, some overlap, and there was still a place for Christianity to seem like it can fit. I think this is particularly the case in in liberalism. Mm -hmm. But what's happened? What I think what happened in the 20th century, and I, and I would want, I think I would want to, if I was going to pick a date to start telling this this story, it would be World War One, and then culminating in World War Two, is that the ideologies become um, cynical. So what I what I is is that they become they're no longer um, in the 19th century. I think people really believed them, and and I think once you get to World War Two and then the aftermath of World World War Two. You're, those those are becoming cynical um, sort of uh, uh, rhetorical window dressing for what amounts to power politics, <laughs> yeah. right? No, and, no, I and, agree. And we'll, yeah. yeah, so once you get to that point, so like look at our current situation. You got like Russia, who's apparently nationalist, China that's apparently, apparently socialist, and we're apparently liberal. But if you look at our actual like political form, an economic form and what we what we all three seem to be sort of converging on they look awfully similar right <laughs> and yeah, so yeah. you know you have um so so the the rhetoric i guess what well, this goes to the second ask, aspect of your question which is why the post-liberal moment and i think it's because that for a lot of a lot of christians are are it's no longer credible that we can coexist in these idea with this within or exist within these ideological regimes largely because the regimes aren't idea aren't ideological anymore i mean like like if you yeah. like an ideological liberals you know <laughs> maybe there's a way of sort of coexisting with them right think about you know what someone who believes in it yeah um but there's no way of coexisting with what that liberalism ultimately turns into right which which is a, a form yeah. of paganism it has to be i mean i think that's the thing about heresy right is it like it either it either returns to orthodoxy or it moves forward into paganism it doesn't get to stay heresy well yeah like that, it's that, like that, that doesn't work yeah I, I, and the thing is you know, once these <laughs> once you get sort of equality fraternity you know liberty and you're, you're correct correct i mean the, the, each one is capturing some aspect of the christian whole uh once they mm -hmm. become divided from one another, however, they actually cease to be any of those things at all. Uh, equality really right. stops being equality. Liberty stops being liberty. And the only reason why they have some semblance of truthfulness in them is, is because there was still a Christian halo that that bathed them culturally. To, so you get someone like Thomas Jefferson, for example, could say stupid things like it's self-evident that all men are created equal. And yet it's 
I mean, and he just sort of inherited that from his Christian right. patrimony and just projected that as, well, that's the rational point of view, obviously. Well, it, it didn't take very long for that sort of whole thing to fall. It reminds me of when you know, I was talking with David C. Schindler one time about uh, how modern science is all about efficient causality, and he corrected me. And he goes, no, no, it's not. He goes, the fact of the matter is, of the four causes, formal, final, efficient, and, you know, um, material— if you you can't just rip one out from right. the other three and have it still be what it is, so modern concepts of efficient causality in science are not the old Aristotelian Thomistic concepts of of efficient causality because that's linked with the others. Now we just have a, a notion of cause as raw force, you know, and yeah. and which is an altogether different. So my my point, in some ways, I don't know, maybe I'm more pessimistic than you are my vision of the future is completely dystopian uh it's not apocalyptic per se but it's pretty dystopian for all of these reasons i'm as i said in a previous interview i'm not a glass half full or a half empty kind of, i'm a where the hell is my glass kind of guy <laughs> where did i put that glass is there a glass I, who has I, a glass I, 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 somebody I has a I'm glass <laughs> <laughs> so who's got a glass i probably <laughs> inclined to agree with you but whenever i go down that road like my wife especially corrects me and says come on like there's children present and then i go well <laughs> yeah. well i i don't like being this way but uh you I know i don't think we've hit rock bottom yet I don't either. Exactly. Yeah, no, no. Right. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm yeah. Really, I'm, I'm, quite I'm, a I'm teaching. Yeah. I'm teaching Christology right now. And, you know, I just got finished, you know, doing the, you know, the, the seven ecumenical councils, just an overview of those. And it, it is really depressing that the heresies have to get really extreme <laughs> before right. there's like so subordination <laughs> is just lingering around for a couple of centuries. And then all of a sudden area says, He's a creature, and then they're like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa!" It is like you crossed the line, right. you know, or, or uh, you know, he only has one nature, you know. And they're like, "Oh, wait a second, you know." Um, but the tendencies are already there and kind of working in in the, in the theology until they get really extreme. And, and I think that's liberalism is at this place where it. I think it's beginning to bottom out, but things are going to get ugly because you know how liberalism works. The, the, the liberalism creates problems which it denies it created. It blames them on its enemies. The, any problems that are in a liberal society are still the residual effects of, you know, classical thought or or illiberal thought. So then you need more liberalism to fix the liberalism, the problems that liberalism actually already created. And and there seems to be almost a kind of sociopathical, you know, that's not even a word, a, a socio whatever as an adjective uh, <laughs> a, 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 <laughs> approach to reality here that is that is really depressing to kind of watch it play out because it's just what we need is more, like if, if in other words like if we really confuse kids really badly about gender and we find that it's having a really negative effect on them like they're depressed and more and more young ladies don't want to go through puberty and be you know still be girls and all that stuff um, then what we need is more education in in gender ideology it's never that, oh, maybe we pushed this too far. Maybe it's always more. And that's where I think, Andrew, you're right. I think it's going to get worse before. And right. Larry, you are right. It, and it's going to get worse before it gets better. I, I it, Yeah, no, I, I think that's right. And one of the things that will happen, and I think we're already seeing it, is that as things go wrong, that blaming of the, so the, the, the liberal blaming of the lingering authoritarianism the lingering traditionalism the lingering whatever becomes yeah. more and more um angry and militant yes right so so like and and uh less you know so so yeah more and more convinced that this resistance must be crushed right yeah. and and there yeah. is the transition out of liberalism right like so like liberalism becomes the in order to fulfill itself it has to become fascism <laughs> well, I think that's kind of one of Del Noche's point. I mean, is the inherent totalitarianism in 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 liberalism, and we and uh, an interesting conversation is whether that fascism is a leftist or a rightist uh, movement, which I think is a very interesting question. You know, yeah, you yeah. Um, uh, it, it it is. I I I don't know. I don't know that it's either. <laughs> yeah, well, that's right. That's it's might be something 
you know, altogether, uh, you know, but I think we're moving. I mean, think, for example, I, I think the anthem of our age and its nihilism uh, and the sort of flowering out and going to seed of liberalism would be John Lennon's song. Imagine that. I mean, the theme of which is if we just didn't give a crap about anything, we'd get along. I mean, I mean, that's in yeah. essence what the song is about. Don't care about anything. And then we'll get along. There's no heaven. There's no God. There's no religion. There's no nations. There's nothing. Nothing. Just, you know, buy my records, make money, live in Manhattan, you know, and, and everything will be cool. Uh, so, you know, th this this cannot be sustained. We can't live in that kind of a nihilistic world of the upside down f forever. And that's why I, I tend to be dystopian but not necessarily apocalyptic in the sense i don't think our future is necessarily a violent one although you know it could darn well be um but anyway uh rodney do you have any uh... the the apocalyptic yeah. note the, the, I, the apocalyptic note here is interesting um i've just been rereading uh louis bouillet's book on cosmos did you guys have you guys ever read that that's an amazing that it's, book has changed my life i just yeah, read yeah. it like eight months ago yeah it's amazing right so he does this whole uh thing on apocalyptic at, at some point like probably third chapter fifth chapter i don't know what chapter it is but um and and of course i get a lot of this from baltazar too is that sort of liberalism is going to have to get very very ridiculous in order to people in order to kind of wake up people who have been stewed in liberalism their whole lives to see how ridiculous it is but i think this is why it's absolutely crucial for the church to really really stick to its guns so to speak because it, people will begin to see the attractiveness of a position that isn't going down this path of of insanity right so it's i think it's extremely important that I mean, this notion that the way to win over liberalism is to become more like liberals. I mean, I just don't get that. I can't no. get that. There's no part of my being that it's can It's just that. bad marketing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it really is. If you hired a liberal marketing firm, they would go, well, do Yeah, you know, it's like... <laughs> I want. Like, I want. <laughs> right mind would recommend that course of action. <laughs> I want. Uh, you guys are too much. That's hysterical. We should just have a whole comedy hour and just uh, roll with it. I once met. This is off topic, but uh, like twenty years ago now, I was at an ecumenical event. A friend of mine from Fordham's doctoral program was a Mennonite pastor in Allentown. He invited me over to his church, and there was this uh, UCC female. Uh, pastor there giving a, you know, a guest lecture or something. And I was talking to her afterwards and I said, do you have a church someplace? And she said, no, no, I, I'm engaged in what's called the ministry of closure. And I said, what's that? She goes, well, I'm a pastor that goes to a church that it's about to close because there are no longer any, it's reached a critical mass where it can't sustain itself and the endowment's gone. So I helped them transition. And I said, and how, how is that going? And she goes, well, they're churches are closing left and right. And I said, to what do you ascribe that? And she goes, well, when your message for a hundred years is the church doesn't matter, eventually people start to figure that out, you know? <laughs> oh, I got better things to do on Sunday morning then, because I mean, they're telling me essentially all religions are equal. Jesus is just a man. Church doesn't matter. Be good to each other. Bye-bye. And then they wonder why the, and so yeah, so this goes to what you're, but we need a liberal marketing firm. <laughs> you know, yeah. the, 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 the church just needs to double. So like the Germans right now, you know, the synodal way, the, the, their attitude is we just need to become more and more and more like that. And and we'll stop the spiral. We'll, death, we'll stop the death rattle of our, of our church. And it's just insane all the way down. Uh, but anyway, now we're down a rabbit hole. I, I of, I think it's uh, I think like what we're getting at is that the, the winning strategy is probably the exact opposite, which is which is the strategy that the early church under paganism pursued. Right. <laughs> which right, is like right. that you, you show the world yeah. that you are very different and that that results on the edges in martyrdom. But the, the martyrdom that is visible to the outside world is just is just the, the edges, the sort of outflowing of the of the real heart, which is the community of love. That's the reason why the martyrs exist. So when when the when the people are seeing the 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 martyrdom, what they're also simultaneously seeing is that alternative way of life. 
that's actually different. I mean, that's right, the thing, right. right? Like we have to remember, like one of the things we have to remember is that, is that the Romans, like sometimes you read history and they present like the Christians and the Romans, but it's like, but the Christians were Romans and the Romans became Christians. Like, like the, the story is the conversion yeah. of the empire, right? Like they chose Christianity. And um, and that's why Christianity became what it became. <laughs> and so it's, this is this is totally possible. And it, it but it has to do with that radical witness that goes all the way to the point of suffering, right? That radical witness yeah. that goes all the way to that point. And there, and yeah. if, if that point isn't reached, so if the willingness for martyrdom, and hopefully not all the way to death, but the willingness to martyrdom isn't there, the witness of the community isn't there. I mean, I think that like, like that's what that's how you know the community is in fact at its very heart Christian, right? Is when it's when it's not yeah. afraid of the consequences. Um, but this is something I, that's been I think, a, yeah. yeah, I mean, it goes to, to the, I mean, we have to talk too about the corruption in modernity of the very notion of what it means to be a citizen. Uh, I mean, Giorgio Agamben gave a talk, I don't know, many years ago now at Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris, and I quoted a lot, in which he pointed out that the first Christians, as you, as you were just talking about, viewed themselves, yes, as citizens of, of Roman civilization, but beyond that, and, and more aboriginal than that, they viewed themselves as sojourners, as not completely at home in any particular country. And in Agamben's point, that's, you know, that eschatological, eschatological edge is what gave them their witness value. And it is precisely what was captivating to the pagan Romans. Here is Here are people who are actually devoted citizens of the empire, and yet something else, something more, not quite at home in the empire, and in not quite being at home in the empire, showing us actually what the empire can be in a better way. Um, and I, I think that that is a, something that is that's one of the reasons why I'm sort of resolutely opposed to like the neocon Catholic project in, in America today. You know, this it's right. your civic duty to do this. And it's, uh, you know, maybe so, right. maybe not. But anyway, I'm riffing now on my own hobby horses. What 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 do you think of, of, of that sort of thesis of Agamben's of not pitting sojourner against citizen, but making sure that, that there's a distinction there? Oh, uh, no, I think that's absolutely correct. I think that's the thrust of St. Augustine's work too, isn't it? That, yeah. that you know, the, 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 the particular regimes will rise and fall, come and go, but that, and, and Christians are as wayfarers, as, as pilgrims in the world are, are real members of those regimes. In fact, by rights, I mean, if, if things, if all things were going well, they would be Christian regimes. We would all be Christians, but that would, they would still come and go. <laughs> like even yeah, if that yeah. were the case there would be you know, you know I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, 19th century uh catholic immigrants to the united states face a lot of anti-catholic bigotry in the sense that you can't be real american citizens because you have a, an allegiance to a foreign power namely the pope and of course there was a lot of stupidity in that accusation and and then catholics have spent the next 150 years trying to prove no 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 we're not we we're not a foreign no 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 we're totally american I wish we'd go back to our fellow Americans looking at us and saying, you have an allegiance to something beyond America. And that's what, say, that, that's right. So like, this is something I, I tell my students all the time and it's right. It's, I think it's right. That, that like John Locke, when John Locke argues that Catholics are the one exception to religious <laughs> liberty, you know, in England, he's right. Like, like according to his own, he's like, that's the correct conclusion for him to draw. Right. Like, like <laughs> in yeah. fact, in fact, Catholics shouldn't be allowed in this liberal regime because of what exactly what you're saying, because we are, in fact, a threat to it. We are, in fact, like refusing to comply with its premises. We are right. And that is that's where you get into this danger of looking at the ancient church, say, and go and saying, oh, they were good citizens, good citizens. It's like, well, no, not actually, not really. Right. Like they denied that the emperor was a god. <laughs> right. Like this, yeah. this is a really important thing they refused to perform the acts of piety that were the symbols of submission to the emperor as a god king right like those things were not were not it's only in hindsight where we say well those things don't really make a good citizen or not and it's like well you're already being a christian when you say that right like that's what the christians were arguing but that's not what the pagans thought yeah. right like the, the pagans thought those things were absolutely essential to being a good citizen of the roman empire 
right? Not and and and, and so, yeah, there. You know, you read. I mean, it's a it's a remarkable. Sometimes you read some of the martyrdom accounts. I was just reading uh, the account of Polycarp, and and in the dating of the document. And it gives, I don't remember, but paraphrase, it's something, it's a typical Roman dating where it's like, who's the proconsul, who's the, you know, like, yeah, so-and-so yeah. was the proconsul, so-and-so. And then the end of it is, it ought to be, and so-and-so was reigning as emperor, right? But the way it ends is, and Jesus Christ is the emperor of the world always and forever, or something like that. Like, <laughs> and it's like, oh my goodness, so provocative, right? Like, that is so aggressive, yeah. That they would date yeah. the account of their we're replacing the emperor with Jesus, right? And it's like this is not this is not being a good citizen of the empire, <laughs> right? This is That's this right. is being a good citizen of. It's like or or you know or you 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 the 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 the, 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 the you get these accounts of of. And we get confused by this because you read the fathers and they are they'll talk about the empire, the government, the emperor, and they'll talk about what it ought to be right and and then yeah. and you you like you emperor could be this and we, and we would be loyal to you and, and and all these but that's not who the emperor is right so so it's like yeah. we, we can get confused into thinking that that they were good roman citizens when i think that they were only good roman citizens on their terms not the pagan <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's so and it was hard it was right. hard for the emperors to give that i mean even after you know constantine became a christian he's like i'm now the bishop of external affairs i, I i'm something of a bishop right i i'm in charge of shit oh sorry <laughs> i'm yeah. Charge yeah. Of here, right you know and, uh, and, yeah. and and then so you see the rise of the papacy as a countervailing sort of like no no you can't do that. Anyway, Hauser, to avoid me uttering any more expletives, perhaps you should say. <laughs> yeah, no, I, th that's all. That's I like that stuff about the sojourner thing and the, and the kind of vantage point, a kind of transcendent vantage point whereby which to judge is an emperor being good or not. And we have to kind of remember, I think it's really important um, that this movement is not sort of idiosyncratically Christian, like already uh, Xenophon and Socrates and Plato to some degree right. are doing this to the emperors of their day, holding them to something that transcends the, the emperor. So this this is why the synthesis, you know, in the Greek fathers or in the in the, in the, in the fathers period of a kind of Greek philosophy and and uh, and 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 Christian theology is not simply a Hellenized, Hellenization. They see what's right. happening in the Greeks as a groping towards what Christianity fulfills. And they're allies. You know, Socrates is an ally in a fight against um, a purely conventional notion of piety, for instance. Right. Yeah. I mean, right. the, those no. Greeks understood that there were natural authorities within society dispersed and diffused that are more aboriginal than the state. I mean, yeah, this is that's not true. necessarily a Christian idea. Yeah. yeah, that's 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 correct. I mean, but but I mean, one of the things and maybe this is going off topic, but I find it to be very interesting. Well, we can talk about whatever we, we want. To tell the story. <laughs> we tell, tend to tell the story of of the Christianization of the empire as if the Roman Empire was this big static thing, and then we just like hold it kind of constant, and then have the Christians come into it, and then have them move. But but that's but we have to remember that like the first emperor who is who is uh, being acclaimed as divine is emperor when Christ is born. <laughs> okay, so like yeah. the, the movement to completion, right? The movement to a a an incarnation of Jupiter on the throne is is the same historical moment as Christ as the king of the church. And yeah. so the empire is doing both of those things, right? And, and and it's almost like two radically different solutions to the the ancient sort of conundrum or problem. It's like, well, are we going to go the Christian route or are we going to go the, the the straight up God king route? like like deified monarch absolutist route and and those sort of culminate in the great persecution under diocletian and then constantine right after that right so it's like right. it's like at, at it comes to a head at that very moment but that's one historical dynamic that's going on right like the romans yeah and, 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 yeah. and yeah anyway it's interesting <laughs> yeah, well what, yeah. what it all argues oh, go ahead rodney no it's just it's a natural problem I and mean, it's a human problem and so, right. So, it's, so, so again, the Christian solution is not just this thing plopped down from on high. It's, right. it's, it, it's also working from both ends, so to speak. You know, it's, yeah, that's right. That's what, yeah, that's what exactly what I'm trying to get at. Which, what, what, what's, what's then interesting then, you know, is, is that 
I mean, all of this argues for the fact that uh, pre-modern civilizations had simply a much more integrated view of society uh, as a whole, as an organic whole, uh, than we do. And, you know, I take it to be, therefore, one of the constitutive and essential aspects of modernity is precisely uh, to fragment, uh, I can't remember who William Cavanaugh in his book, Field Hospital, quotes somebody, I can't remember for the life of me, remember now, who talks about modernity as an inverted totalitarianism. And, and by that, he means modern liberal totalitarianism, if you want to call it, and the Del Noche aspect of it, um, actually adopts hegemonic power, not by consolidating things, but by scattering things, oh, yeah. by diffusing things, by robbing things of their essentiality, of their natural authorities, bleaching them all of meaning, so that now all you're left with is this raw, monadic, autonomous individual with nothing mediating between it and the state. So we are all in this Hobbesian world now, essentially. Um, I just find that notion of, of an inverted totalitarianism absolutely fascinating because I, I, I'm not certain I completely understand all the ins and outs of it, but I, I think it's really onto something in the comparison of what modernity is about versus pre-modernity. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I find along those lines important from the Christian the, the Christian insight is that human nature is malleable. Okay, so like what I mean is like like virtues and vices are real second natures, and human nature, like an aspect of our nature, an essential aspect of our nature is the formation of virtues and vices. Right, that's like human beings are creatures that form virtues and vices, which means we are creatures who who accumulate second natures, right, which are social in nature, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like virtue and vice formed socially yeah. together, yeah. right? And yeah. so who we are in, is a social being. I mean, because we can't do without those habits. That's in fact, how our reason works. I mean, this is, so So, the the, the thing though, the, to get at what you're getting at is that what I think one of the things that happens in modernity, especially among the liberals, is that because they essentially deny that, that um, they, what they what they in in the end create are are vice machines <laughs> so like the society becomes a mechanism of vice of the propagation of vice rather than the propagation of virtue what so i what i call it uh, i call it the collective of concupiscence uh yeah and, right no yeah the irony there or the thing that's that is peculiar about it is that as it becomes more complete and as it is capable of habituating people deeper into viciousness the anthropology that liberalism supposed at the beginning becomes more accurate. Yes. Right. Like, like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? yeah. Self -fulfilling yeah. We, we do actually in the end start to resemble the self-interested actor, Yeah. the self-interested autonomous actor yeah. because, and, and we'll never actually yeah. get all the way there, but we, we, we more closely <laughs> resemble it. Right. But, but the mistake yeah. is to think that that's the way we must be. <laughs> well, that I think that's part of this whole notion of, of an inverted totalitarianism, because, you know, yeah, you go from a, a human nature perceived as part of this grand nexus of ver a nested hierarchy of various meanings and mediating institutions and all kinds of natural authoritative structures. And then you go through a series of historical steps where modernity has essentially destroyed all that. And so now you precisely are left with you know, just simply the remnants of a human being and exactly the kind of human being that liberalism said we were that we were all along. Uh, and right. now, you, need the, <laughs> you know, you need the state to manage that, of course, you know, build back better and uh, well, everybody I mean, wear your mask. Remembering that for someone like Hobbes, you know, you think about yeah. Hobbes who posits who posits really a picture of total depravity in the beginning and then um, the the like society, any social interaction. So so any sort of human to human interaction that's not warfare only emerges once the Leviathan emerges. Mm -hmm. So like there isn't even there isn't even language until the hegemon emerges. Oh, so interesting. Yeah, right. Interesting. And so, so like so you think about that as the liberal perspective, it would be like, well, we're only capable of having this conversation right now if if because there is a hegemon, a violent a ubiquitous hegemon on top of us. 
right? That's keeping us from coming after each other. <laughs> and and I, my, I mean, my point is that that, that if you want to like liberalism, there's sort of, I, I think of liberalism as having sort of like the dark side. There's a dark side of liberalism, which is, mm -hmm. which is the Hobbesian, uh, you know, and, and that that seems to be the side that is coming to fruition, right? Like it really is the case that we need that hegemonic Leviathan to mediate all of our human interactions if all of our human actions are, are self-interested and contractual, right. right? Like if that really is the case, then there has to be three. There has to be the two contracting parties and the, and the enforcer, right? Like, yeah. uh, and, and yeah. so you need a ubiquitous state. You need a single ubiquitous state, yeah. right? Uh, otherwise Very we will be at war with each other. No, it's a, it's a chap, I think what you so, were saying. So they already knew that this is what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's fascinating. It's, it is, again, it goes back to yeah. our, our, our thing about things kind of coming to a head, so to speak. But, but I yeah. often think that if you look at what's happening to the modern university, you, you get a microcosm of, of where we're headed, right? So, because, so, so if you think about it, like um, in the 70s and 80s, what, what uh, most Catholic theologians in America were doing was were griping about uh, you know um, free academic freedom like it was all everything was about oh yeah it was, even in that the 90s, quaint was, little idea yeah yeah all that thing right so until so you want that because you want to be able to like teach you know obvious nonsense <laughs> about about God and the Trinity and, and and all sorts of in the church and everything and that's what happened I mean people literally were just you know teaching the most I mean I or make they, jokes about the provost. Yeah, yeah, no, right, yeah, right. So I so, used to do that. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Um, so, so, so it got so bad. Right now, what, what's ironic, of course, is that having weakened any unified Catholic worldview because it, things had gotten so radically pluralistic because of the creepy notion of freedom that was going on there. The irony, of course, is now you have this hegemonic liberalism, which literally does everything that we were supposed to be afraid of the Catholic Church. Uh, for doing, but it has to be, <laughs> yeah. right? But what yeah. makes it kind of pass, I think the reason they don't notice it is because they they believe it. Yeah. yeah right? They, they, oh, this is just <laughs> the reality. This is Once just true. Once you believe something, it doesn't feel like oppression anymore. <laughs> I mean, come on. Everybody knows, everybody knows that a man can get pregnant. You know, <laughs> that's just reality, man. Right, come right, on. right. I mean, this is one of the things, you know, it's one of the things that actually converted me away from liberalism. I mean, when I was a, when I was an undergrad, I started college as a libertarian and was in, was into this, you know, economics and all that kind of stuff. And one of the things that, that I remember annoying me was that I was reading these guys, reading Hayek, reading people like that, and they were predicting pluralism. They were predicting, oh, there'll be, there'll be many different values and many different things. But when I was actually looking at the world, what I was actually seeing was homogeneity. Yeah. Yeah. yeah <laughs> it's like, yeah. no, actually what's happening as liberalism advances is not pluralism. what's actually, and even someone like John Rawls talks about this, like there's going to be a pluralism and all this kind of stuff, but it's like, no, actually when it plays out, what you get is the most tedious hedge, like homogeneity, right? Uh, that's what occurs because the truth of yeah. human nature is that diverse is because human beings are social in their nature. Diversity is always social diversity. So it's, it's communities of diversity, right? And if you, if you eliminate those communities, if you eliminate those like, uh, intermediary groupings and authority structures, then you're going to have just one at the top and that's going to produce a conformity at the bottom. Right. That, and that's that that's because their anthropology is wrong. Like they were yeah, wrong about that. They predicted pluralism Some and what they got. <laughs> somebody just re somebody just recently asked me you know it's like how come you don't read more of this the stuff from the other side and, uh, and and is it because you don't like to read things that disagree with you and i said no i don't like to read things that are boring <laughs> and, and, and the, the, the fact is this stuff is boring because you're right it's just this it's just this pablum it's this porridge it's this homogenous goo that that really doesn't rise to the level of profundity i mean as david hart would say it scarcely rises to the level of nonsense and <laughs> and you know and it's just so boring it's unbelievable i i, I said in a blog post once I, I don't know when i said is there anything more boring more horrifically dull than being forced to listen to somebody talk to you about their sexuality. 
<laughs> because, I mean, that's got to be the most. I don't no, even care about my own sexuality. Like none of us care. Do I have a sexuality? <laughs> I don't think I have a sexuality. What is that? I'm sure that's part of the LGBTQIA spectrum. You're, you're on Someone without a sexuality. It's got to be one of those acronym letters in there somewhere. I think it would be the uh, A. Well, they do. They have that. They yeah. have that. <laughs> yeah, I think they you do. even have a flag. <laughs> Pretty sure. There ain't enough colors in that rainbow to describe me, I'll tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah it's, i'm just i'm just a walking kaleidoscope is what i am uh, but anyway i think we're veering off into nonsense now because i have veered because off you took nonsense. us there you know i took i i took it there gentlemen we have now been talking for about an hour and 15 or 20 minutes last thoughts let's start with the rodney and then we'll give uh, dr jones the last word go ahead rodney no, I, I just I, I really want to thank Andrew for for joining us today. And I think that was a really uh, fruitful conversation. And I, I'm always jotting down notes while we're doing this, to, you know, uh, and I and I learned a lot from from the discussion and things got clarified. I really like the uh, the analysis of, of liberty, equality and fraternity as representing yeah. three values that have to be held together, but are kind of ripped apart. And that still seems to be divided. And that still seems to be defining the world we live in uh, uh, in in in. Um, in, in 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 kind of care in these characteristic ways um so yeah i think that's i think that's really key and i and i think also this um sort of augustinian note is is important that we sort of constantly have in mind what a just city looks like you know we've been gifted with that to some degree in in in, in god's self-revelation and, and even in reason to some degree and just to always hold that and not kind of say, well, that's not going to work, right? I mean, that that because that 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 is precisely all ready to enter into it in liberalism's terms, right? So, in other words, it has to work for it to be true, or something like that. And and I just think I love Big Dave Schindler's thing. You know, success is not a gospel category. Um, that's I think important to uh, to remember. So those are my final thoughts. But also just that I really enjoyed this, and and uh, am grateful that you came on, Andrew, to talk to us. I'd like to say too before we go to Andrew. Um... A, a, just a big tip of the hat to big Dave Schindler because uh, yeah. David L. Schindler has been talking about this stuff for, you know, know. 50 years before yeah. a lot of other people were and, and God bless him for it. But anyway, Dr. Jones, last word. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you for having me. I, it was great. Um, I mean, I guess, I guess what where where I would conclude here would be, you know, maybe, maybe bouncing off what you said about the, what's possible is, is, you know, this is weird, weird thing among Christians, right? That we, we like, we believe sanctity is possible. Like we know there are saints, we see them. Like we, we believe people are capable of whole, a degree of holiness, not perfect perfection, but we're capable yes. of becoming more holy. Yeah. And that's like an uncontroversial thing for us to think. Yeah. But then as soon as you say, and therefore societies are capable of becoming better, holier, right? Not, not the utopia at the end, but like improving, moving towards the goal. And people are like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And it's like no, we're <laughs> like if one is true, if the individual is capable of sanctity, and we're social, we are social in our nature, we're capable of a degree of sanctity as a people as well. We can move, and so there's there's hope, always hope of improvement, which is all we're after. Okay, so that's one thing. Then the other the other thing I would say is that is that the 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 one of the things that's come up a number of times in this discussion is the importance of. Um, the non hegemonic or like the, the what we think of as like subsidiarity basis of authority structures in society and of, of groupings of human beings. And that when we face this world of huge powers, huge states, huge corporations, all this stuff, it can be daunting and terrifying. And like, well, we can't do anything against this. And it's like, well, that's right. You can't do anything about that. Luckily, that's not as important as like your neighborhood <laughs> and your yeah. family. Yeah. And luckily yeah. the thing that's actually the most important is something that you can in fact do something about, right? Like, so, so like for us to realize that we all have power and to just look where our power is and then use it, right? Yeah. Like that and not get, not get demoralized by the fact that we don't have power places where we don't have any, <laughs> right? It's like, yeah, that's right. I don't have any power o over there, but I have some here in Steubenville and I'm going to use it. You know? <laughs> see, my power is, you can see my power. 
right here. This is <laughs> this is where my power yeah. is limited to right here. I know I don't mean to like take room. it like a, like a sort of like power postmodernity type direction, but really, I mean. No, I agree. I I could not agree it, more. Really, a lot of politics that, is about power, and, and we got to claim it. Claim ours. And I would just well, thanks for the conversation, guys. Rodney, as always, thanks for helping me co-host these things. And I I want to reiterate once again just how great. I think Dr. Jones' book is Before Church and State. Um, it's a tour de force, I think. It's got some lovely endorsements on the back by people like John Milbank and so on, and his new book, too, on the two cities. Um, so I highly encourage people to, to get those books if you want to know more about this topic. Hey, gentlemen, thank you very much. And I'm going to hit the uh, thank you. stop button now. Stop record. Stop. <laughs>